Hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm not going to give much in the way of introductions, uh, but it's really nice. It's great to be here. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, so, uh, my name is Ahmed Ansari. I'm a design studies candidate um, at Carnegie Mellon University. I'm in the PhD program in the School of Design over here. And what I'm going to be talking about, about um, is uh, partly related to uh, my practice um, and also the sort of very much tied into my research over here. And, you know, I'd like to start uh, this talk with a little bit of um, history. So this is the what we call the world system um, in circa around about 1300 AD or CE, if you go with the common era. And what we notice about this, um, you know, the world, the state of the world, um, and the sort of at least the sort of Euro Asians, African sort of the, the three big continents is what you'll notice here. Um, this is taken from uh, a world systems theorist, uh, Janet Abu Lohud. And Janet Abu Lohud was very, she was, a, she was trained as a macro sociologist. And, you know, Abu Lohud was very interested in trying to understand what led to the development of and the rise of Europe um, after the 15th century. So what were the conditions that gave rise to the Renaissance? Um, the sort of, you know, led to the decline of the church and the rise of the nation state. Um, and then eventually what led to sort of European hegemony through colonization? What, what she was interested in questions like, you know, why is it that Europe, which was such a minor world player in the year 1300, how did it become such a major world player later? And how did it happen to establish, uh, you know, it, where, you know, how, how did it manage to become such a key driving force behind globalization and the sort of structure and form of the modern world today? Uh, so she was interested in questions like, well, what are the origins of capitalism? Uh, what enabled the Industrial Revolution? Um, you know, and what role did colonization, well, in fact, you know, even, even going beyond that, what, what was it that enabled colonization to happen in the first place, right? Uh, so what's, what I find particularly interesting about this map is that what we see, first of all, is that there are no, this is a world that has no major world superpower. There is no one civilization that uh, enjoys a hegemony or, or that dominates the rest. Uh, in fact, what she identified was that there were circuits or large regional sort of like trade, uh, political and economic circuits. Um, so you have South Asia and sort of Indo-East Asia. Um, you have China in, in at one extreme of the sort of the world system in 1300 CE. And on the other extreme, you have Europe at the very edges, right? So you can see that there, and towards the middle of the map, what's really interesting is that you have, you see what is now, what we now call the Islamicate. The Islamicate, uh, you know, the, the world economy at that point, interchange and interaction between world players is strongest at uh, what she and what other world systems theorists like Emmanuel Wallerstein called uh, the core. So one of the sort of like um, core principles um, that world systems theory organizes itself around is this idea that in any kind of world economy or world system, there will always be certain countries or regions or civilizations that enjoy and that, that have the greatest sort of like depth and richness in terms of interactions in, you know, in trade and commerce, and politics and so on and so forth. So interactions are richest at the core. And these are usually the countries or regions or civilizations that are also the wealthiest, right? And the most sort of like uh, involved in, geo in politics at the sort of geopolitical scale. So what you see uh, in 1300 CE is that Europe actually at this point in time is, one of the, is not one of the major world players. That sort of belongs to the Islamicate, 
uh, to India, South Asia, the Indian subcontinent, and to the East Asian economies, to particularly China and Japan. And so it's, it's worth thinking a little bit about, about this. Um, from a slightly more technical designerly point of view, what this sort of um, told me the, the shape and the form of the world, it was not a bipolar or unipolar world, you know, six, 700 years ago. There were, in fact, many different worlds uh, coexisting with each other, sharing the same planet, coexisting alongside each other, contributing to trade with each other, um, exchanging ideas, exchanging uh, sort of, uh, you know, traditions, tr exchanging artifacts, exchanging technologies. There was technological exchange. But what's interesting is that what I find particularly interesting is that nevertheless, these were all distinct, unique worlds, separate that developed along different trajectories, um, you know, different trajectories of development for hundreds, thousands of years. And they all developed unique and different plural ways of being in the world and of thinking about the world and approaching reality. They developed different philosophical systems. They developed different value systems. They interpreted reality differently from each other. They had to um, accommodate or adapt to different climactic conditions. And there's a Japanese philosopher, uh, Watsuji Tetsuro, who actually wrote, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, critiquing Martin Heidegger's philosophy, early philosophy of being in the world, uh, where he uh, talks about how he links, he makes this very interesting link between climate, local climate and local environmental conditions and the development of culture and technology. So in other words, different civilizations in different parts of the world developed completely different responses to uh, both climactic challenges and then, of course, social, political, uh, economic, cultural challenges. And what this means, uh, in other words, I think what I'm trying to get at is that what we saw six, seven hundred years ago was that there were different artificials Different civilizations following different technological trajectories, creating different plural, many different kinds of artificials that were qualitatively different and rooted in very different sets of ethics, value systems, and ways of thinking about and coping with the reality in the world at large. Um, and this, you know, it, it was, in other words, it was a pluriversal world. There was a plurality of worlds, um, all sort of coexisting with each other. And this is not really the case today. But what happened in between? Um, with the conquest of the Americas, what was a pluriversal world was basically uh, fragmented. Uh, and sort of slowly taken over by, you know, starting with the colonization of the Americas and then later the, the colonization of Africa um, and then the sort of contention between the European powers and the, the sort of larger empires or civilizations in Asia. Um, what happened was that the Europeans essentially displaced all of those different plural ways of being and thinking. Um, and in a, in a sense, the argument that I'm trying to make here, uh, and this is an argument that kind of chimes with uh, a lot of post-colonial and decolonial theorists and scholars, is that effectively those many different trajectories, those many different sort of uh, civilizational trajectories were all sort of, they all experienced a rupture of sorts uh, when they confronted European civilization which at post, you know, post 1300s was on the ascendancy, was on the rise uh, due to a variety of uh, complex and intertwined. Uh, and also, you know, uh, these changes did not happen instantly overnight. They happened over many hundreds of years. But essentially what the, what the other civilizations had to contend with was European civilization. And European civilization then became the template for this. Uh, so, European, you know, colonization then laid the sort of foundations for 
what we, what world systems theorists at least now call uh, the modern world system. And this world system is unprecedented in the history of the human species because it is the first world system, like, like I said, there were earlier world systems too. But this, I think, um, was the first world system to be both global in scope and totalizing in its nature. That is to say, wherever the Europeans went, uh, through various um, colonial logics, right, uh, of which, for example, one was the invention of the category of race. Uh, so how we understand the modern conception of race was something that uh, Walter Mignolo and Annabel Puyano and some of the decolonial scholars going back into the history of the colonization of the Americas have sort of talked about this and have pointed out how uh, Spanish and Portuguese colonizers invented uh, sort of new hier invented the basic concept of race and then invented the notion of racial hierarchies. Uh, and that, that you know, the racialization is therefore an example of a kind of colonial logic. But there are other log logics too. And I think the one that uh, perhaps is most worrying to us today is, is the sort of um, the perpetuation of what has become the sort of modern global world economy which is capitalist in nature, neoliberal and capitalist in nature. So globalization, in, eff in effect, the, the way that the decol uh, decolonial argument goes is that you know, globalization happens, uh, is, is merely a continuation. Coloniality and colonization did not end with decolonization in the 20th century, uh, you know, in the, in the early to mid you know, 20th century, but in effect, what happened post-World War II and post-decolonization uh, was the uh, institution and the formation and the emergence of a new world system that borrowed and built itself upon the old colonial order. So it was essentially the return of, uh, it was the old empire in a new form. Uh, and, you know, uh, Ramon grosbach uh, who is a, one, of the one of the prominent Latin American uh, decolonial scholars, basically talks about um, different kinds of hierarchies that exist and per exist to this day. And they are very much a part of the reality that we exist in today, right? They are, they are what define the modern world system and its world economy. So he talks about things like, for example, uh, you know, the nature, the nature of the market and the structure of the market and the relation between the market and the state and the very idea of the nation state. These are not ideas. These are not concepts. And these are not structures and institutions that were indigenous to many of the civilizations that had invested invented that had existed uh, prior to European colonization. Um, in effect, they were inventions of Europe. Uh, and so we've, in a, in a way, we've inherited all of the kind of hierarchies that we uh, have taken for granted today, like global class formations, right? Or, uh, you know, sort of the, the assumption that the default or the de facto uh, hierarchies and gender are always male-centric, Right, males are privileged over females. Judeo-Christian patriarchy is fa favored over other forms of gender relations. Um, sexual hierarchies that favor heterosexuality uh, over homosexuality or other forms of sexuality. There were cultures that had uh, conceptions of more than one gender, for whom the normal was actually having more than two two genders. Uh, you know, those cultures had their conception of gender and their conception of sexuality and biology displaced by European conceptions, right? And I think one of the most important things uh, to keep in mind is this, particularly this number nine, right? Which I want to talk about in a little bit more detail, is this idea of an epistemic hierarchy that privileges Western knowledge and cosmology over non-Western knowledges and cosmologies. Uh, and I believe that that is particularly important Right, and then the other is this uh, this idea that you know Grosbach Gill talks about a media informational hierarchy, where Western media institutions dominate global news, global communication. Uh, the internet is mostly uh, you know has been monopolized by corporations that are effectively 
um, housed in, but also uh, completely controlled and run by sort of Western interests, not only in terms of power dynamics, but also in the ways that they think about information and media and technology. And to these uh, two, I would add two more. These are the ones that I'm particularly interested in for the purposes of my own work. Uh, so number 16, I would also add that if we think about different civilizations as developing di along different socio-cultural, economic, and political, theological, ethical trajectories, then we can also think about them as, as sort of developing alongside with very different technological trajectories. And so what I would argue is that, in fact, the ways in which we think about technology, what it is, our relation to it and its relation to us and its relation to the world and our relation to the world mediated through technology, the ways in which we think about technology, the ways in which we make technology, our practices, right? These and the environments that we have built, right? In other words, the artificial, uh, you know, the everyday artificial environments that we inhabit, the artifacts in them, and the sort of material practices that we engage in, in those environments, these are also, in a sense, Anglo-Eurocentric today. And so they are another form of hierarchy. Um, and so what, I, therefore, what I'd like to sort of uh, cap my lecture with and is talking a little bit about this idea of technological and artificial hierarchies. Um, so there are three types of colonial subjects. Um, you know, and it's worth also noting that uh, the sort of colonial problem or the neo-colonial problem uh, is, is different, exists and manifests differently for all three, three types of subjects. Uh, the first is, of course, you know, there are this, you know, if, if we think about our modern condition today, then what coloniality creates is three very different kinds of subjects. There are ex-colonized peoples who enjoy the benefits of being modern. So they have bought into modernity. They have bought into the way our civilization, our sort of world civilization is right now. So they, they've completely accepted its tenets. For them, the market, the state, uh, you know, sort of uh, our ways of thinking about gender, our ways of thinking about race, all of these have been normalized. They've, they do not question them. They are effectively hybrids in and of themselves. Uh, I would call myself a hybrid in the sense that I am not entirely of my own culture, but I am a global citizen. I am a sort of hybrid of East and West. And I can enjoy the privileges of being modern to an extent that others cannot. The second category of colonial subject is those that I would call the dispossessed. These are the people who have been disenfranchised by modernity. They too are hybrids, but they don't get to enjoy any of the trappings of modernity. They slave for us in factories to produce our smartphones. Uh, you know, or they are excess baggage. They are the refugees of climate change. Uh, and then the third sort of category of colonial subject is uh, people who exist on the margins of the current world system, the modern world system. These are peoples that have not yet been completely assimilated into the modern world system. They could be examples of Aboriginal or indigenous tribes in Colombia or in India, right? These are people for whom modernity and many of the trappings of modernity, they have either successfully resisted or have not been yet exposed to uh, the sort of workings or the dynamics of the modern world system. So to come back to my uh, sort of uh, earlier um, argument, you know, if we think about there existing many different plural syncretic worlds, um, then what our modern condition very much looks like is something like this. Uh, we, our conception of reality today, that is the present, our understanding of our own predicament in the present and our framing of the kinds of problems that we now face in the present, of which climate change and sustainability is one right, is very much bound by the limits of what we know. So in other wor words, my argument is that our ability to imagine different futures, 
to imagine a different future world, different from that which exists today. Let's say that it's a more sustainable world. That is very much contingent on the horizons of what I know exists, what I know to be uh, true today, what I know to exist today, and then the horizon of what is possible and what could exist is bound by the horizon of what I know. So the horizons of my knowledge also dictate the possibilities, the, the horizon of po future possibilities, right? And the problem is, is that we only have our sort of horizon of both knowledge and also the horizons of possibility are very limited because we all kind of subscribe to this very anglo eurocentric way of looking at the world and what i argue is that instead what we need to be thinking about uh, as designers but you know this would as equally apply to other professions um is is trying to think beyond this and trying to think of many plural future worlds and many different kinds of artificiality, many different kinds of artificial environments, right? Many different future worlds, technicities, and artificialities can coexisting together the way that they used to. And for that, we need, you know, it doesn't do to simply look at the future and simply rely on what we know. We need to bring in new knowledges. I think what I'm what I'm trying to say is that. We need to bring in new ways of seeing in order to reveal new ways of being in the world. And this can only be possible by including many more people who think differently, uh, fundamentally differently, uh, and, and trying to recover different ways of thinking and seeing that have been lost to us over time. And so, you know, a sort of agenda, you know, two programs or two agendas that I would... Uh, I did, that I have identified for designers that are working in this sort of, uh, from, a, from a sort of decolonial perspective or standpoint, or who uh, espouse a decolonial politics. Uh, you know, there, there are two programs that I've identified. And I will end my lecture by outlining them both very quickly. So the first program has to do with empowering and emancipating these people. Like we need to encourage more designers coming from the margins of the world system and not from the core uh, to stand up and to show their work. So, uh, for, you know, uh, things that that first program sort of does or that agenda does is, you know, the creation of alternative spaces and platforms is very important. Um, you know, and these need to be platforms that are not your conventional mainstream, you know, CHI or DRS or sort of like Western dominated institutions. The second is, you know, revealing, I think a second uh, part of that program is revealing, critiquing, and challenging the mechanisms of the world system. So uh, like a lot of the group, the members in my in the decolonizing design group and the platform, what we do is we will point to things like, we will point to the materiality and the technicity of asymmetrical power relations. Well, you know, uh, Mahmoud Keshavar uh, wrote his dissertation on passports and on bordering. Uh, and that is an example of what I think articulating and sort of bringing out, uh, you know, the, the nature of uh, coloniality in the modern world today, and especially how it manifests through the artificial, through material things. Um, and then the last, uh, the last part of that first program, I would say it's sort of bringing, I would say that you know, this is something also that the decolonizing platform has been fairly involved in, is bringing the sort of uh, these rich conversations, these discourses that are hap happening outside of the Anglo-European sphere, right? Bringing those to design practice and pedagogy, and also bringing the sort of canon of uh, post or decolonial or anti-colonial theory to inform uh, sort of contemporary design practice and pedagogy. Uh, so that was the first program. The second program is slightly different. The, I see the second program as, as a constructive program. So if the first was about articulating power and creating alternative platforms, the second is more about creating alternatives. And for that, there are three programs uh, that I see there. The first is sort of this program of in order to design an alternative, one needs to de-link from or decouple from. Uh, the logics of the sort of world system. 
Um, so that I see as a sort of necessary first step. The, the second step for decolonial designers is to confront and negotiate their own position vis-a-vis -vis the colonial rupture. Like I said, depending on what kind of colonial subject you are, and of course, even the, the specific history of colonization in your country. Colonization in India did not happen the same way it happened in Latin America, for instance, right? Um, I think one needs to look at and understand and question the nature of the colonial rupture and, and look at how distinct technological trajectories were uh, disrupted uh, at the point of colonization. And then the task is to derive new discourses and new points of view, new ways of thinking and seeing new methodological approaches, new theories, new ethics, uh, you know, uh, and there are ways to do that. Uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll talk about one of the, one of the ways to do that uh, in, in a little bit. Uh, the third thing is developing alternatives, you know, designed alternatives to capitalism uh, and to the mechanisms of the modern world system and encouraging local growth and development on, on indigenous terms not on terms dictated by the World Bank or other international institutions. So, uh, you know, uh, my, my own, I think I'll end this by, uh, you know, sort of pointing to the kind of project that I personally am very involved in. And this, you know, my central idea was that if at one point there were many different artificials, many different technological trajectories that were not what we have seen uh, come from uh, European industrialization and mass production and mass manufacture. And if these artificials were more sustainable, if it meant that they encouraged and created new socio-material or socio-technical practices that were more sustainable, then for me, uh, you know, uh, being a sort of historian and a theorist uh, philosopher, what I'm particularly interested in is tracing and recovering genealogies of techniques and artificials, other techniques and artificials. So I'm very interested in histories of and philosophies of technology that are not European. Uh, you know, specifically in my, my own interests lie in South Asia and East Asia. So particularly looking at India and China, but these are examples, these are sort of civilizational histories, uh, philosophies, ethics um, that are not, that did not lead to um, and conceivably should not lead to the same ways and means and forms of technology that we have arrived at through European industrialization today. Uh, for this, you know, a fair bit of historical and archival uh, sort of research is required, but I do believe that this is an ag agenda, uh, this sort of project of mine, is also, I think, essential to design in the sense that it makes design history and the history of technology, and the sort of philosophy of technology relevant to design again. And uh, I guess if I were to end, I would end it with that, that uh, there is, there, that this would mean that, you know, one cannot ignore the sort of philosophical and historical foundations of our technicity and our technological modern condition today. Uh, and if you, and I would point to this as being a way forward for designers who are interested in sort of recovering and driving new ways uh, of, of making, uh, making technologies and making the world material. Uh, thank you.